Hey everybody, this is Gary Vaynerchuk and I am the author of Crush It. You know, new media is redefining everything. You know, I mean, if you're in the restaurant loving world as I am, the big you know thing you looked for was a Zagat rating and now I don't look at that and I look at my iPhone and look at what Yelp scored it, right? So, and that's community, you know. So, uh, this is gonna far outreach just wine. I mean, every single word of mouth impact of business, which I don't know if you know this, is every business in the world, is going to be affected by this shift. This is, this is printing press big. This is not you know, some little fad. This isn't about Twitter. This isn't about a Facebook fan page or Tumblr. This is game changing. You know, the internet that we know, I know it went back further, nerds, I'm sorry, but I'm talking about the one that we know, the one that AOL started sending CDs in the mail, is about 14 years old. And if you think about the impact globally, financially, business-wise, that it's had, it's staggering. And to be naive enough to think that it's not gonna have a way bigger impact going forward, I I don't even wanna think about what's gonna happen in five years. It's just a totally big shift. These are big waves and they're constant. This is a hurricane, this isn't a a drizzle. And um, so I think it's had a big one on the wine industry. You know, I I know what Wine Library TV has meant to wineries that have gotten good ratings or bad ratings. And when I can do something as one individual with zero cost, just sweat equity, and create a platform like Wine Library TV that has the same impact that things like the Wine Spectator and Robert Parker have had, which have had decades of a head start and millions and millions of dollars and tons of infrastructure, that needs to be paid attention to and understood that it's replicatable in multiple platforms. You know, I, I think it's funny. I think there's this huge trend that everybody's so excited to diss, you know, Parker and Spectator and the 100-point scale. Um, but at the end of the day, if you really go back prior to them coming along, wine was this big. And I think that at some level, it made it a little bit more inclusive. You know, people understand what a 99 means in a 100 point scale, what a 81 means. And before you blame Parker and Spectator, you should blame the retailers and the wineries who've made them big. You know, if I didn't put Robert Parker shelf talkers on every wine in my store, or when I emailed out saying 95 points Parker, well, he wouldn't mean anything, right? So, well, obviously not just me, I mean everybody. But, you you know, so I I think that it's imperative for people to understand that I think it had a lot of value. Uh, Do I believe that community-driven stuff like Yelp is going to be important? Sure I do. That's why I bought Corked.com and why I'm relaunching it now and which is actually, I mean we probably just relaunched it by the way which is amazing. Uh, You know, so yeah, I I mean a a big misconception of Wine Library TV, what I do is um, people think I want to be the new Parker or the new Spectator and I have no interest in that. I just want to build wine self-esteem. Yeah, I mean you know what's funny is that my dad had a liquor store. We were shoppers discount liquors. That was the store I grew up in. Wine was not a play in my household. Um, My dad drank vodka and cognac because he's a good Russian boy. That's what we do. Um, So I first fell in love with wine when I realized people collected it. And so my reading began at 17, 16 because I wanted to know a lot about it because people collected it. That was my hook, I was a collector. The actual loving of wine started really happening at like 22, 23 when, you know, It started going from being a commodity to being, oh man, I really like this stuff. This is interesting. Look at these crazy flavors. Like how the heck did that just taste like a racquetball? Like, you know, those kind of things, right? So um, there was one specific Amarone that I had at a tasting when I was 22 when I could really taste the chocolate. So much so I walked outside and called my mom. Remember like when cell phones were like this big? And you were like, you know, like, like that. I called my mom and I was like, mom, it's gonna happen. I can taste these things. I can't believe this, but I just tasted chocolate in this wine. And that was probably when I was like, oh, this is really getting good. I was just enjoying it. Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I think, you know, I turned 30 on November 14th, 2005, and, you know, there is a 1% of unhappiness. You know, I'm like, okay, I want to buy the New York Jets. And so that's going to cost a couple billion dollars. Am I gonna really make a couple billion dollars selling just wine? 
and the realization was I could have, I very much feel I could have had big, big things happen. I launched Wine Library in 1997, but the laws in this country, I mean, people watching this video right now in Boston can't buy wine for me, right? So I want to do something else. And at the same token, as I was feeling this itch in November, I went to a tasting in December and realized people did not have wine self-esteem. They wanted to drink the same old stuff. They wanted to be jerk-offs to each other because they thought they knew something because they read it in the latest Spectator. I just felt the wine culture had a lot of opportunity to be much cooler. And you know, there's so many places around the world that I've traveled to where there isn't this you know, uptight aspect to the wine industry. It's much more part of culture and day to life. And I, I felt like I was the kind of character, I knew my personality and my DNA and my hustle could create this platform that not only would be successful, then by virtue of that success would create a different kind of culture. So it wasn't so much that I was dissatisfied as if it was just I wanted to change the game again. You know, there was an amazing feeling for me when I launched winelibrary.com in 97. It was one of the first wine shops to do so, less than a handful, and it changed the game. It blew up my family business from a couple million dollars a year to ultimately, you know, 50, 60 million dollar a year business. I wanted to do that again. I, you know, I want to be a pioneer. It's what I want to do, and so um, that's what I did with Wine Library TV. You know, I. If anything, and maybe it was a little bit too aggressive, you know, I, I, I just, I just emailed everybody and was like, hey, let's do this. Like, you know, check out my show. What can I do for you? At the same token, I think, I don't think of that as a mistake. I feel as though I was a little bit more raw. I think, you know, six months later, I was a little more polished, but I wasn't more selective. Everybody's like, why don't you get selective? Don't hit up everybody. Hit up the top tier. You know, you can't blanket email everybody. You know, when people talk about marketing, I think that's crazy. I, I feel like. Wine Library TV was itsy bitsy tiny in 2006, but if somebody hit me up, they'd be really happy to have the relationship today. And so, you know, what, just hit, the hit up the top 500 Twitter people today? That's insanity, that is elitism. So, you know, I pride myself in having a lot of hustle. And, uh, and, and, you know, that's what I did. I mean, if a top wine blogger was upset that I was hitting up everybody, it, you know, that might have been a mistake in some people's eyes, but not in mine. And so, I'm sure I made a million mistakes. I mean, I built a big business around me. You know, it's not the most scalable thing in a lot of people's opinions, but to me, I understand kind of the vision that I see going forward, and uh, I try to stay away from mistakes. The mistakes I make are the opportunities I haven't taken, like big platform television, things like that. I'm sure there's mistakes in my nose, but there's very few, let's get really obnoxious, there's zero mistakes in my yeses because normally, my threshold for a yes is first learning, not necessarily the results. I need to know this. You know, I've thought about VCing companies just because I've never been VC'd, even though it's a stupid thing to do financially for the learning process. There was one big moment. That was the day I was on Conan O'Brien's show and Slate.com wrote a huge profile on the same day. And that, and, that, and this was in August of 07. So Twitter was still a baby. And that whole community, we all knew each other, kind of, sort of. And so it became like the only thing people talked about on Twitter, watch Gary on Conan, which was really cool. And was really my, I was really starting to fray into the tech world, the web 2.0 world, the social media world, whatever the heck you want to call it. And um, it was one of the first people to kind of make it, right? Oh my God, he's in his office talking about wine. He's now on the Conan O'Brien show. And it went really well on top of that. So it, it was a big moment. It was the first time wine was getting late night exposure. On multiple levels, it was an interesting and important moment, um, both in the wine business and in the tech space. I would say that is the one moment that really I can pinpoint. Other than that, I'm not very big on analytics and metrics and paying attention to traffic and did we go 23% and this and that. I know what I'm doing is right. There's no ounce of me of, that has any doubt. And I work for myself, so there's no justifying it to the dinosaurs that pit sign my check. So that puts me in a very substantially good position in a lot of ways. Plus, I've done it before. I mean, I was making lots and lots of money, thousands of dollars a week and selling baseball cards. You know, I've built up a family business in the first year, I ran it from three to 10 million in sales. I, I know what I'm doing. There's, when it comes to making money and building brand, it's just something I was born with. I'm not gonna pat myself on the back. This is just, it's DNA. I'm a marathon runner. You know, capitalizing on something like that just doesn't, you know, how did I, I, I sign with CIA? You know, I got more exposure, Nightline did a piece, Ellen did a piece. 
you know, it got lots more Twitter followers, people cared more. I mean, there was a lot of things that happened. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, um, what I think is important is that people have to understand it's a marathon. You know, building a business doesn't happen in six weeks. There's no shortcuts. You know, getting a Twitter account isn't a magic potion. You know, people like, you know, roll up on me, especially in 2008, I got a Twitter account. I was like, great, what do you want, a cookie? I mean, it's like, you know, it's not gonna change your business. Um, but, you know, at the same token, the people that think this stuff is silly and it's not important are just trying to draw lines in the sand because they don't want to be a part of it. And that's a huge mistake because unless you're retiring in the next six to 12 months, you better understand what this is all about inside and out. My vision is that I sell so many copies of Crush It that HarperCollins gets off my back and I can wing these next nine for the rest of my career. Is that a good answer? You can tell them, they know exactly. You know, the funny part is this. What I love about it is I signed with Harper Studios. It's a totally different model. You know, they, I got offered almost as much for one book as these guys gave me for 10, but the rev share in the back end was substantially more. So they've changed the model quite a bit. And I, I'm betting on myself, right? So, you know, obviously I want to participate and win on the back end. Um, so I, uh, I'm very hungry to see what I can do with this book and uh, I'm gonna work really hard at it and um, I'm very confident. I know you guys are big time and there's a lot of people gonna watch this video so if, for the people that watch this video, if you leave with one thing out of this video, even though there's much more important things being said about life and happiness and making money about just playing the game perfectly in my opinion, this is what I want you to leave with. When you go into a wine shop not only if you remember what you like or don't, or know what you like or don't, no matter what it is, or you have no idea, just like the question was asked, you have to try a wine from a varietal you've never had before. Please don't buy another Pinot Grigio, another Zin, another Pinot Noir, a different kind of Chardonnay. No. Tanat, Chinon, you know, Rueda, Albarino. You know, these are the things I want you to look for. You've got to try a wine from Cajor, you know, from Bandol, from, you know, Atarantes from Argentina. So the answer is this. I can tell you right now, you are a wine expert if you spend two years and in that window you never order the same kind of wine. And if you do that, and then you, once you hit all the wines you can kind of find, Gruner Veltner, or Rieslings from Germany, Rieslings from Washington State, you know, different places making different grapes, you're gonna be shocked of what you know and how much you understand your palate because everybody who's watching this right now, here's what you're really doing. You're only drinking Coke and Sprite every meal and you have no idea if root beer, Hawaiian punch, grape soda, black cherry, you have no clue. Tomato juice, pomegranate juice, you have no idea if you like those because you're sticking to Pinot Grigio and Pinot Noir. Please, for me, try something new. There's two countries right now that I think you can be very safe in finding some really neat stuff. One is South Africa. If you order a Chenin Blanc or find a Chenin Blanc, very crisp, very clean, very aromatic, great with shellfish and light salads, you can get them for eight to 12 bucks all day long. And in red, hands down, the dominant country in value in my opinion is Portugal. You know, Portugal is just ripping. I think the quality out of Portugal for seven to twelve dollars is staggering. I actually want to do a 2020 investigation on how much these people are getting paid over there because I do, can't figure out the math of how the wines can be so good and they can deliver them for seven bucks. So from the Douro, the Dow, Alentejo, these are places that really make some great, great Portuguese wines. What your palate likes. So the makers for sure, the pedigree's important, right? Um, you know this builder's good, you know this chef's good, you know this car maker's good. You've got a reference point to knowing if the wine's gonna be good. But this is farming. I don't care if you're the best winemaker of all time, if it rains every day, you're finished. So that's also very, very important. What I think is most important when you first start learning is understanding the grape varietals. Understanding the difference between Chenin Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc and Riesling and Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris and there's a lot there that will really be the foundation of what you like. 
the real move, like the date move is to like Google, ask, you know, like esoteric grape varietals, right? And just like ask for like, you know, do you have any late harvest Grenache from the Banyul? You know, totally like throw off the Psalm with the mad skills, but you've got like only one move. Um, if you want to be a little bit more authentic, which I highly recommend, I think it's imperative to name off three wines that you've had in the past that you've liked and ask the sommelier to go in a different direction with varietal or from a different country, you know, and to expand your palate. I think, you know, there's a romance with, you know, being on a date of saying, you know, to your date, you know, let's explore some new stuff together kind of thing. I like cabs, but what else would I like? Well, you might like tanat because there's big tannins and big fruit, you know, and so that would always be something that would be my go-to move. You know, I think if we're living in the Google era, right? I mean, I feel like you can learn so much more by reading good blogs like Venography or Fermentation, um, Dr. Vino. There's, there's just too many good resources uh, from the blogosphere uh, and from forums. And you know, what I love about Corked is not only can you review the wines, but then people can comment on those reviews. So like creating threaded conversations around wines I think is, is very cool. And so, uh, I'm excited about the fact that I don't think people have to spend $150 for a class or you know, necessarily buy a book. Now, both are so worthwhile. Classes, there's that engagement, interaction. Books, it's kind of there with you. You, can, you, know, I, you know, I still think there's nice romance about a book, um, though I'm thrilled for Kindle or e-read or whatever. You know, however you want it, iPhone, knock yourself out. Um, it's all about the content. But I, I think there's so much free content out there that I don't necessarily need to sit here and recommend a source that's gonna hit somebody in the wallet. Save those 20 bones to buy a good bottle of wine. Yeah, we were talking outside and, and you know, I was saying you'd be shocked what happens between 15 and 25. The wine world right now, 25 to 40 bones, you can drink world-class stuff. You know, you start getting into the Chateauneuf de Pop world, Priorat world, you know, you start getting into wines that you can't necessarily get to under 15 and they're, they're really sensational. Really, I feel like the quality of a wine, given the depressed market and given the advances in farming, a $30 wine today probably tasted as good as most $60 to $80 wines a decade ago. That's powerful. I mean, you know, it's powerful. You know, it's a very good direction for the wine drinker. I think it's very obvious. And so, uh, if I could say anything, if you're into wine, you know, you start looking seriously at 25 to 40 bones, you can get some crazy stuff. No. You're gonna overpay. That's all. <laughs> I got nothing there. I mean, Wine of the Month clubs are fine. Listen, I created one for Gary Vaynerchuk and Wine Library TV because I wanted to create one that was legit. I mean, people are getting ripped off. They're paying full value for fancy packaging and a letter that says thank you. You know, so, you know. No. I, I think that the best way to do that is to find sources that you respect and trust, whether that's Wine Library TV or another blogger um, or a local wine merchant. You know that that's the only way he's going to keep you is by giving you great service and saying, don't buy that, try this. Um, but I really do think we're going to see an explosion in things like Corked. I mean, that's why I'm so bullish on it and launching it now. I think Yelp has provided a platform that people understand that community-driven scoring has value and I think that's gonna come to wine in a big way. I think Napa Valley, <laughs> you know, I hate being so anti-USA, right? I think Napa's massively overvalued. Uh, I think, I think Priorat in Spain is overpriced. The wines there tend to get into that 60 to $80 range. Um, I think that there's parts of Bordeaux that are overrated, I think the left bank overshadowing the right bank, meaning Pouillac and, and you know, the Madoc, those kind of wines, um, Saint Steph, those kind of wines tend to uh, get more reputation than maybe a Saint Emilion and Pomerol. I think it's a mistake. I, I think there's, um, there's a lot of places that get a Barossa Valley. I mean, I like it, but it's not insane. So I, I think there's a substantial, Tuscan, I, I should have started with, I mean, I think Super Tuscans in Tuscany, can get very overrated. I mean, so many of those wines start at $60, $70 a bottle, and I think that's insanity. So, you know, I think, um, I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot, especially when there's so many underrated places like 
the Provence and Languedoc and, uh, and McLaren Valley, or, or Clare Valley in Australia. I think it's crazy. Okanagan in Canada, you know, Baja, California, Mexico. So there's, it's interesting. Yellowtail gets blamed for something that was happening also with Robert Parker and Jay Miller's impact on Australia. Let me explain what I mean by that. Robert Parker's the, you know, gorilla in the room, very important wine critic, and he started rating a lot of Australian wines that were under $20, 92, 93, 94 points, the Marquis Phillips stuff, you know, it's, you know, ball buster from Tate. I mean, there was wines that getting big scores under 20 bucks, and so consumers started saying, well, why am I gonna spend 50 when I can spend 20? And I think Yellowtail came out at the same time, had this big marketing push, became this huge brand, and create a scenario where people blamed Yellowtail for everybody thinking Australia was a $10 price range category. So all the premium Australian producers really got hurt in that period. But it was really because the Parker scores and the economy was starting to soften. And Spain and Portugal were coming on strong with $8 wines. I think it was a perfect storm that Yellowtail gets blamed for. Um, You know, so... Yellowtail is executed on something that's always worked in the U.S., which is good marketing and a little bit of sweetness. You know, they have a little bit more sugar levels in those Aussie wines, than, and so people like that. And it's easy to drink, and, and kudos to them because they were very aggressively marketing, and they, and they really got a lot of support from some big retailers around the country, like Sam's and Total Wine. I thought they played that very smart. I think there was a lot of smartness to what Deutsch did there, and I have a lot of respect for the way they built the brand. I think the goodness proves that wine can be, cu- you know, you can still build big brands and leveraging marketing and pop culture. Um, I think the bad thing is is that, you know, people fall in love with it and just drink that. I'm not as mad about. I don't feel bad for the Australian business people. They're the ones who relied on Parker and Spectator and never built a real business in the first place. So I'm not so worried about them. I'm more worried about the consumer that drinks a magnum of Yellowtail Shiraz every night and I want them to try different things. Well, I think Tony Torlato did it. You know, he brought Corvo and Santa Margarita into this country. That's a, quite a feat. Um, Kendall Jackson, Jess Jackson, was the pi- one of the first pioneers of building a real big brand. What he did with KJ is monumental. Um, you know, but there's not a lot of innovation on the retail side, I mean, on the producer side. P- you know, everybody ripped up their plants to plant Pinot Noir. It's a lot of chasing and, um, and not a lot of innovating. You know, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of shocking. It's probably why I was able to do so well in that world. Not because I was so good, but more because of lack of competition. My mom. And my dad. He'll punch me in the face if I didn't add him there. My parents by far. Um, But if you want me to break out of that for a second, I would say that I'm a storyteller. I think my success is going to be because I'm a great storyteller. And and that's how I build brands. I tell stories to the the world. Um, To me, Walt Disney, Vince McMahon, um, and the notorious B.I.G., are also great storytellers that I respect. My dad told me very early on, your word is bond, right? He said, he said, uh, you know, it came at a good time, it was when I was into Wu-Tang Clan too, so I've heard it in the, in the hip hop song, so it probably was a little more powerful to me, but the fact of the matter was my dad told me, you make a commitment. I became the buyer of the store at 22 years old. He said, you make a commitment No matter what happens, you eat that wine. You made a commitment. And that is absolutely to this day the reason I think I'm doing well in a lot of ways. Because I think DNA wise, I'm a very ADD type of character and a lot going on. But because that principle has been stuck in me, it's helped me not have egg on my face probably a lot of times where it could have really hurt me. And it's a very substantial core of my principle. An ethical dilemma. Probably with Wine Library TV, uh, I remember I was doing a Cabernet Franc episode and I wanted to have a Cabernet Franc from every part of the world. And we only had one California, four or five of our California Cab Francs were out of stock. And the only one we had was from a good friend of mine, Sean Larkin, who let me sleep in his house once on a trip. And I did the show, we opened up the wines, and he's always made great Cab Francs, so I was very confident going in 
that it wouldn't be anything weird, but they were never too spectacular that I'd give it a hundred or anything, right? And I didn't like it. And I, you know how you can think really fast and even though it was only two seconds? I just remember thinking, oh man, this is not interesting. This is not a place I want to be sitting. And I went on and panned the wine and he really got pissed. You know, phone call, F-bombs, fight me after school, the whole nine. You know, so it was a, it was a very difficult thing. It was an interesting crossroads because nobody knew that I'd stayed at his house in 1996, you know? It was a long time ago. And so it was tough. It was disappointing for me. But you know what the best part is? Now we're back, right? Like, he gets it. So like, it's like, it's cool. You know, I mean, I just think at the end of the day, you can't win in this new world by not being 100% transparent. Your personal brand is your resume. You know, if you think anybody's hiring off a resume in three years, you're out of your god darn mind. You know, 90% of people I know Google you first anyway, no shot. So, whether you like it or not, I'm just laughing at people that don't think they're selling, right? You know, the hippie movement in, in San Francisco in the tech space that sometimes busts my chops. That They're always selling too. They just don't realize it. They're not selling the way, they think they're selling in a different way, but they're not. You know, and what push cuffs to shove, if you're not selling, you're gonna go out of business. And, and they always sell out to the big corporations. So, you know, you know, this hierarchy of don't be a salesperson or don't promote yourself, you know, I understand and being too much is definitely a bad thing and I'm at fault at that at times, I get it, but I'm just, you know, excited. And, and I think that it's important to build a personal brand because it's the only thing you're gonna have. Your reputation online and in the new business world is pretty much the game and so you gotta be a good person because you can't hide anything and more importantly, you've gotta be out there at some level. I mean, if you've ever left a comment on a blog or if you create a profile page on any public site, you are a personal brand. You're, you may not be a big one. You know, Timmy behind in accounting may have a Facebook page that's public and, and a Twitter. He, you know, Timmy's a personal brand. He may not be hustling for it, but I promise you, Timmy, if you want to be an accountant at VaynerMedia one day, I'm looking that up. So, you know, it's a platform that can allow you to do very special things. It's not something you can run away from. You know, being you know, an introvert is not a negative. You know, you don't have to be obnoxious and over the top. You can be yourself, that's just fine. Um, but to be naive to the world we're moving towards where information's at your fingertips and it's readily available and everything you do is being monitored. You know, you have a problem with Big Brother, you take that up with the era that you were born in. You know, take that up with your parents or God or the world. But the fact of the matter is you're here and you've got skates on and a hockey stick and I don't want to hear you crying about wanting to be a basketball player. And if that analogy doesn't make sense, I understand, but the fact of the matter is this, you know, we're living in a very connected, transparent, everybody knows your business world and I think you need to embrace that and harness it, not run away from it because really it's the reality of the marketplace. Putting it out there. Right, like you know how many junior level executives sit in meetings and want to vomit all over the place from what's being said and say, oh my God, the man, senior management or the CEO or my boss just doesn't get it. The ability for you to create a blog or to tweet about your thoughts, and I understand you can get fired, so you've got to be smart. I'm not telling you go rogue here. You know, people get mad at me when I say that. I'm not telling people to grab guns and go into post offices. I'm just saying to, you know, this is America, it's not Russia. You know, you, you have the right to, you know, speak your mind, you know, and so, um, I, obviously you've gotta be respectful to the rules of the company that pays your bills and you can't get fired and you don't wanna go on un- unemployment, but, you know, I think it's very smart of, you know, somebody writing, I have an idea, and just putting it out there because once you put out your smarts, you've got a real shot and, VaynerMedia charges you know, tons of money, you know, a hefty, hefty amount of money a month consulting, but I put a lot of it out for free on GaryVaynerchuk.com. The reason it works is because I talk in theory there and when I have a client, we talk specifics. And there's a lot of nuances and navigation through specifics. And, uh, and that's kind of where that's at. I just want people to, uh, who are watching this, you know, obviously I understand the profile of people that would watch this, to understand that I and plenty of the people that I respect 
are not in the business of collecting a million Twitter f- friends, you know? This isn't haha. I'm not here to, you know, joke around. I'm, we're here to build big businesses. This is a platform shift. You know, you've got to understand, we've been playing under the same rules as society for a long time when it comes to telling stories. Newspaper, magazine, radio, billboards, you know, television, and television way up here with other print media that was quite important. I mean, this is big. Anybody can be in the game. You, I mean, just, that's wild to me. The fact that you could become the authority about foreign affairs online and not spend a lot of money is staggering. Now, you have to have the chops. You probably spent a lot of money on co- your college bills or you know, learning it or paid your dues. But the most important chocolatier in America can make $7 million a year, right? Through sponsorship and speaking engagements and deals, selling chocolate. That person can come out of the internet in 24 months for the grand total of $5,000 and a crap load of hours. And I just don't think people can believe in it because it wasn't true 36 months ago. And I understand why people don't believe in it, but I know it's true. And I'm excited for this shift because I think a lot of people that have, would have never been able to be really happy talking and conversating around the thing they love most are gonna be making $79,000 a year and maybe not a buck 10, but 79, but boy oh boy, waking up at 11 o'clock, eating Captain Crunch, you know, hanging out with their kids. And then the people that have the true talent, listen, I feel like I'm gonna make billions from the platform. So, you know, it's just really a big shift. It's a game changer in business. Everybody will be affected by it. And the quicker you wrap your head around, instead of making fun of it, because you just don't want it to happen, and learn a little bit, touch it a little bit, don't give up after three days, oh, this is stupid, and understand where it's going, because boy, oh boy, there was a lot of chatter about how stupid Amazon was in 1995 and six when I was doing winelibrary.com. All the same conversations from my industry, the wine industry, about how stupid winelibrary.com was and how it wouldn't work and shipping laws, it worked. And so uh, did Amazon and so did the Huffington Post and so are many, many, many other things. So it's reality. It's only gonna get much bigger and stronger. And it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a lion, you know, if you get a little lion and you have it when it's like a couple days old, you can have it in your house as a pet. You just can. And when it's a little bit older, it gets to that weird zone where it's kind of like bigger, but you're still kind of okay, bigger than a dog, not too scary. But eventually that damn lion's gonna eat you. And uh, <laughs> if you keep it in your house. And I, I think this internet platform, not Facebook, not Twitter, not YouTube, the platform of the internet, it's gonna eat up every other one and so, you better pay attention. I think that there's, um, you know, it's really endless, right? I mean, there's not that many people that own a space, right? I, here's what I know. Anybody that spends a good amount of time in their computer and they think about wine, I've got a really good chance of being the first thing they think about. And the fact that there's not a beer version of that and a coffee version, I, I, you know, and going to the thing I believe in the most, I think tea in this country is gonna be monstrous. When? Probably five to nine years from now. You know, but boy oh boy, if you start laying down the foundation now, owning that niche, owning the pockets of tea drinkers in this country, Starbucks is gonna have a $10 million contract in front of you in eight years if you pump out. If, if I switched to tea library TV right now and ran it hard for five years straight and did everything that I think about doing, there's not an ounce of my body that doesn't think I can make $10 million a year in five years. So. That, you know, I, I think that there's yoga and gardening and, you know, sports center. Where's the sports center of the web? You know, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of, lot of niches. MMA. Who's the MMA personality online? Who's the person that everybody, who's the Bill Simmons, the sports guy, ESPN version, for MMA online that every single day, I mean, there's money in that. You know, advertisers are clamoring towards that sport and, if you are the internet voice, there's big dollars in that. So I think that if people really follow their passion, that's why I wrote this book, and really owned that space, they, because they love it, that passion, they'd spend the 18 hours a day in the trenches that are needed to build this business. Because 
this is a marathon. I, you know, I didn't stress about capitalizing on Conan because Conan was a little piece in a much bigger game.